My name is Carol Doherty, State Representative of the 3rd Bristol District, Taunton and Easton. I have the great pleasure this afternoon of introducing Mark Asenal, an Estonian and author of this book called The Imposter's War, his first nonfiction publication. I hope you enjoy the presentation. This is, this is indeed a privilege uh, for me to have you here, Mark. Uh, to receive this citation from the State House. And I have to tell the story about how this came to be. So the, um, I guess it's the Massachusetts Book Awards group um, sent an invitation around to everybody in the State House about the fact that they were having this Book Awards ceremony, if you will, on October the 24th in the Hall of Flags at the State House. And then there was a special note to me from the organizer to say that there was someone from Easton who was also um, listed on the must read list of the Mass Book Awards. And I thought, oh, so I put it on my calendar and then as things happened, something intruded to prevent me from going to that event. And I said that to Ellen and, and she said, that's okay, because Mark had to leave early anyway. <laughs> so you probably would have been gone by the time I got there. So all things work out very well. But I felt a little bit, um, let's see, maybe the word is chagrined, I guess, that I might have disappointed you, not even being there and not even knowing that I planned on being there. But to myself, I had promised myself that I was going to be there because it's such a source of pride, I think, to have someone uh, of your stature, of your reputation, living in the town of Easton, right next door to my good friend and select board <laughs> member, Craig Barger. So um, all of that put together, I felt badly that I was not there. So I uh, rang Ian and told him part of that story and asked if the library might be interested in uh, providing an opportunity to present a citation to uh, Ian that he can put in the bottom drawer of his desk if he so wishes, uh, not to Ian, but to uh, Mark, um, from the House of Representatives in honor of the publication of, as I understand it, reading the websites, uh, your first nonfiction book, The Imposter's War. And I am I'm taking an interest in it. And I think my aide Matthew said that he's a read it or at least read a synopsis of it. So you can give a critique later, Matt, <laughs> on that. Um, and I just, I just uh, asked Mark if he was going to say a little something, of course, and um, read something from his book. So he's going to do something, and it should be interesting. But I am also intrigued. I read the Boston Globe all the time, and you never know who you're going to cross paths with. Uh, as you go along, and um, I learned that he uh, was on the spotlight team for the um, marathon bombing uh, event there. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that, uh, a little bit about that as well. And it's so interesting to me how paths cross because there's a fellow in Taunton who is a photographer, and he's always everywhere at little parties and big events, taking pictures. He must have millions of pictures. And he, uh, over his time as a photographer, uh, always, always went to the Boston Marathon to take candid shots to, of the Boston Marathon. And he was standing on the steps of the library directly across the street from the place where I believe the Sanaya brothers put the bomb in a, in a trash barrel. And he caught them making their way down that side street and around the corner um, Caught, had many frames of them making their trajectory uh, along uh, Boylston Street, I think it is. So it, I, he was absolutely stunned when he looked at his uh, photographs to see that he had 
he had them dead to rights and shared that. And, and I believe that the photographs that he took were instrumental in um, uh, catching uh, the Zanaya brothers uh, uh, as well. So, so the, our paths cross, you working on the story, me reading the Boston Globe, <laughs> and knowing the fellow who took the picture that captured the attention um, of the world, I think, as your, as your work on the Spotlight team did. So I'm, I'm very delighted that you were willing to take time out of your busy schedule and bring your good dear wife with you, um, and my colleagues who are on the select board, Dottie and Craig, um, not to mention Ian, and that's all of us. Good thing there's not 100 people in the room because I couldn't name them all. So I'm just delighted to be here and to know you um, and to be joined by friends here in honor of your book. And um, I was hoping that you would be bringing some books with you so I could buy one, but I'm just gonna have to go online and do that, aren't I? So let me, why don't you come and I'll give you somebody, Matthew, maybe you could take a picture of, of this, this uh, presentation of the citation from the state house. So I'm delighted to do this. So the citation reads, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the house, very impressive, right? The, it did, right? <laughs> the House of Representatives, be it hereby known to all that the Massachusetts House of Representatives offers its sincerest congratulations to Mark Arsenal in recognition of the award-winning publication of the Impostors War, the press, propaganda, and the newsmen who battled for the minds of America. Very interesting. The entire membership extends its very best wishes and expresses the hope for future good fortune and continued success in all of your endeavors. Given this 21st day of November, 2023, at the State House, well, here in Easton at the Quisset House, Yes, is that right, the Queen's House? Signed by our Speaker of the House, Ron Mariano, and myself, State Representative Carol Dougherty. So this is for you. Oh, thank you. And thank you very much, and thank you for your work. And I'm going to go, I'm going to buy that book, and I'm going to read your other books as well. So please. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, very nice, Rep. Really appreciate that. Quick sidetrack, it's the second proclamation I've ever gotten in my life. The first was from the Rhode Island State Senate on a day where I saved the life of a state senator who had tripped in the Senate chambers and smashed into a tall ornamental light post. The glass globe popped off the top and started coming down right towards his head. And just on instinct, I just snatched it out of the air, handed it to a page who was right there, and I, I had cut myself, and, and people made a big deal about that. And people were coming up to me, oh my God, you saved his life, you saved his life. I'm like, probably didn't really save his life, but I did save him from getting smashed on the head by a giant glass globe. Not long after that, um, uh, he was indicted. And um, <laughs> people were coming up to me saying, you had to save his life, you had to save his life. Um, <laughs> so uh, I just thought I would just talk really briefly about how the book came about, The Impostors' War. It is the historical biography of uh, a newsman, a reporter, and an editor by the name of John Ratham. Not that that was his real name, but that was the name that he went by in a, a really impressive newspaper career that went from uh, in the United States, in North America, in Canada, the United States from about 1890 until his death in 1923. He became one of the biggest voices uh, against German propaganda in World War I from his post as the um, editor of the Providence Journal. And this was, see, I found out about this when I was working at the Providence Journal, where my wife and I met, uh, in 2004, we were working on the 150th anniversary of the newspaper. And me and another reporter were doing a special section looking at the history of the journal. And of course, we came across Ratham, who was the editor-in-chief of the paper from 1912 until 1923. And there were two things about him that were really mysterious. Number one was, how did this guy become a national figure from 
this post at the Providence Journal when he was competing with the New York Times and all the big papers in New York and across the country. But he became the Providence Journal and his work, which was then serialized in other papers around the country, became the absolute place to go for stories about German espionage in the United States during World War I and before, uh, German sabotage. Um, and he became a, a real thorn in the side of German diplomats before the United States broke off diplomatic relationships with Germany and then entered the war. So that was one thing. How did this guy become so influential? And the th second thing was, uh, we look back when we were doing our series on, on the history of the paper at what they did 25 years earlier at the er last anniversary of the newspaper. And those guys had discovered Ratham and just fell head, just head first into the Ratham vortex. And they, through great detective work of their own in the late 1970s, had realized that that was probably not his real name and that he was an imposter under a fake name. And that was an unbelievable mystery that was, uh, I just couldn't let it go. I just couldn't let it go. We did, we did our, our story and moved on. I wrote about other things, but I never forgot Ratham. How did he get so big? What did he do? And who was he? Who was he really? And why would he change his name and live to, right to his death under a fake name? So those are the questions that sort of kept this story alive in my head. And then about around 2018 or so, I did a really short piece on Ratham for an event the Boston Globe does called Globe Live, where we rent out a theater in Boston, we sell 600 tickets and fill the place out, and then reporters just get up there with notebooks like this and a microphone and tell a story exactly like I'm doing now with, you know, uh, art projected on a big screen behind me. And it's really, really popular and people really like it. And so I did a little tiny piece about Ratham, just one little scandal from his amazing life where he um, got into a really nasty political scrap with an up and coming politician uh, named Franklin Delano Roosevelt over a, um, uh, a, a sex scandal in the Navy uh, centered in Newport, Rhode Island. And people really liked it. Uh, they found it uh, kind of interesting. Who is this character at the time? I still didn't know. And then, and then I think just part of the, partly because of the reaction from that, from that piece, I thought maybe it is time to really write the Ratham book. And you know, it, it kind of was because I couldn't have done this book 15 years ago the databases that I used to write it didn't exist. You know, um, but so many newspapers now, a lot of it came from news writing and so many papers now are digitized. I mean, Ratham was originally from Australia. Australia has a wonderful online archive. I'm sure Ian, you guys must, must have uh, been, it's called Trove. It's unbelievable. You can read newspapers from the 1850s looking exactly scanned and looking perfect exactly, exactly as they are all character searchable, all word searchable. So those databases didn't exist really 15 years ago. So I don't think I could have written the book then anyway, but this was my pandemic project, chasing John Ratham, you know, from Australia to uh, British Columbia, to the West Coast of the United States, Chicago, and finally to Providence, um, leaving a trail of like embarrassment and wreckage wherever he went. Uh, and then finally discovering and who he was, and then coming up with my own theory for why he changed, why he, why he stepped into the costume of an imposter and wore it every day for the rest of his life. As far as we know, no one ever knew who he really was, including his wife. So that, that was my, my pandemic project that kept me sane when everything was locked down and there was nothing to do and all our vacations were canceled. I worked on this. Thank you very much for having me and really appreciate it. And, you know, if you like, uh, it's a piece of history that I think uh, people, if you're interested in propaganda wars, I mean, sort of what the Russians did to us in 2016, the Germans did to us in 1950. And it just, 
it just was easier. It's just easier now because you can have a bunch of guys sitting around St. Petersburg clicking on mice in the middle of the night, pretending to be Americans. The Germans actually had to come all the way here to screw with our elections and mess around with um, and try to turn Americans against each other. Um, but they really, they, they did, and Raytham was right there to try to expose them. Um, so um, I would humbly recommend the book. And, uh, uh, and it's a book about not just about history and World War I, but also journalism. And, and I think, uh, I would hope at least that you would see when you read it the passion I have for that vocation. So thank you very much. It's very nice of you to host me tonight. And thank you for this thank wonderful proclamation. So He, he, was, uh, he was born in Australia, which at the time, Australia was a dominion of Great Britain, so he was British by birth. Came to the United States, did become uh, a citizen of the United States, you know, despite the, you know, the casual perjury on his application, uh, such as a name that does not actually exist. Um, but he, he was very much on the side of Great Britain in the war. So, you know, World War I, Britain, France, and Russia, essentially, against the Axis powers of Austria-Hungary and Germany. Um, he did not, I mean, the British tried to influence American opinion with propaganda. He didn't write about those things. He wrote about German propaganda, German efforts to mess with American industry, to mess with our minds through propaganda. Uh, and to uh, mess with our government. So that was his, um, that was his target. Um, he thought that, that uh, Germany was sort of already at war with the United States. Again, the United States didn't get into the war into, for almost three years after it started. So during that period of American neutrality, all the countries of Europe were messing around in America, trying to stir our, trying to get Americans to think on their side. Um, and, you know, and Ratham was one of the most powerful anti-German voices in the United States during that time. Yeah. So this past summer, um, I took a course in propaganda over at Harvard, and we uh, dug into the literature on World War I propaganda. So, for example, like Harold Laswell's uh, Propaganda Techniques in the First World War. Uh, so I, I came to realize that there's a very rich literature on this topic for this time period, and I was shocked at the connections to like you were saying to today. So I guess my question is, as you went about this, this pandemic project of yours, how has your understanding of uh, propaganda techniques evolved and how do you see things today? I think I see that there, there's always someone trying to influence your opinion all the time, whether it's Coke is better than Pepsi or, you know, game cleans better than all, right? I mean, that's sort of like we call it white propaganda. It's like, you know, sort of know, kind of, you can see it, you sort of know what they're trying to do. It's not really a, a really surprise uh, what they're trying to persuade you to think. Um, you know, Ratham was sort of a master of gray propaganda where, you know, you don't know what the source is. You know, the source is maybe a newspaper article with, um, you know, with blind sources or, you know, stuff that people pass around on Facebook um, uh, that, pretend to be facts, but you have no idea really as a, as a consumer whether or not this is, this is real because you don't know the source. Um, so I'm, I'm, I see a lot, I see that a lot now that now that I've done this book, I can, I'd say, oh, white, pro oh, great propaganda. Oh, that's a great, you know, and black propaganda as it's called, which, you know, the source is false. You know, you think this is, you get a text, you think it's from your bank. In fact, it's from a guy in, you know, I don't know, in Egypt trying to steal all your money. And so, um, but I think this, what really crystallized is that everyone is always trying to influence us, whether governments or um, companies, you know, media figures. I guess I'm kind of doing it right now in a way, right? Yeah, any other question or? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the other work that you've done and in particular as part of the Scotland team? 
Yes. So I, I joined the Boston Globe in 2010. I started at first in the Washington Bureau and um, I covered the White House which sounds really glamorous, but is not very glamorous. It's a lot of people sitting around in an office. You know, it's not, it's not that glamorous. Um, uh, and I covered national politics and the, us in the Congress, usually the Senate, so the U.S. Senate. And I had a desk in the Senate press gallery. So I did that for about a year. Then I was able to transfer back up here. This is where my family is. So came back to Massachusetts and joined the Globe in the main bureau as a general assignment reporter for a while. Then I covered, um, I covered gambling when the gambling industry was moving into Massachusetts. I covered that process for three years. Very exciting, hot topic. Um, the marathon bombing. I had just finished the gambling story that day and I was thinking, hey, maybe I'll even get out of here a little early. <laughs> never think that, never admit that. Uh, because uh, then commotion uh, at the news desk, I tell something's going on. I went up to an editor and I just said, look, I just filed if you need a writer for anything that's happening, I'm available. She said, thanks. And next thing you know, all these feeds from all over the place were just coming to me. And it was like suddenly my job to put all these things together into a sort of a cohesive narrative. And I write about this a lot in the book about writing something that's going to be in a history book and writing that on deadline for a newspaper, knowing that it's going to be in a history book. You know, and Ratham did it himself, you know, the great Iroquois theater fire. He wrote that. Um, he wrote a and it took a while for me to get my hands on it because it was during the pandemic and I couldn't, he wrote it for this a paper in Chicago and, and I couldn't really get there. Um, but some unbelievably wonderful clerk just like scanned it for me, sent the whole thing. Couldn't believe it. Um, uh, but it was a, a beautiful, uh, powerful story that conveyed not only what happened that day, as if you were there, but also somehow conveys the emotional power of the moment, you know, which, which is sort of the thing that I have to now try to do. Right. So I, you know, I wrote, you know, the, you know, the lead story, there's many, many stories in the paper that day, but the lead main bar story, as we call it on page one, I had to pick, I had to write that and write that all through with all the different feeds coming from the finish line, from hospitals, from like all, from many, many places. And, and I kept doing that. I did that for the first nine or 10 days after the bombing. Um, and then um, I did join the Globe Spotlight team, very famous, all the stuff in the movie. I, the movie is true. I know all those people, it was before my time, but I'm friends with all those people. And, uh, and that's what we do. We do long-term investigations. We're writing about housing right now. I've done stuff on incarceration, we did stuff on disparities in death, in the where people die, the ages of people die, depending, can be very much affected by their income and where they live. Um, we did stuff on that. Um, I did, we did a very long and torturous investigation of a, of a very nasty Me Too situation at MIT. You know, so I worked on that for a long time. And right now we're doing housing and I'm, uh, in fact, I just filed a 4,000 word housing story yesterday that will run in December that we'll work on for a while more. So, so I don't know what, what I'm going to do next. It's sort of my time to kind of rotate off the team. Um, maybe I can stay for one more project. I don't know. Um, I like doing it. I like being on it. Um, I like my colleagues on it and I like the work. I feel like <clears throat> journalism is has probably both well it's obviously always been important but it feels like it's more undervalued and needed now more than ever we don't we lost our local newspaper and yeah. we can't get any coverage in Houston so yeah. when we have something important that we want to share with the community it, we have to use social media and other means to reach people and it's been a real hardship for us uh, a lot of people like online reading, a lot of people like the actual paper, yeah. and uh, we can't really appeal to people like that. So the great things that we're doing, we don't get to reach as many people as possible. And 
you know, the bad things that are happening. People need to know that too. And yeah. uh, and that's that's not able to be able to be reached. So I just want to say thank you for um, the the great work that you've done and you know the focus and the integrity that you bring with it. It's really important. Thank you. That's very nice. Uh, I I agree. It's um this is a really tough time time for the news industry, the news, especially small papers, you know, um, hedge fund chain ownership has been really difficult for the industry. And there are a lot of places where we've lost a lot of small papers because, you know, they sort of, they get bought, they get stripped, essentially jack them up on cement blocks and sell the rims. And then um, obviously readership goes down because you're investing less in news gathering. And when readership goes down, there's an excuse to then sell the real estate and walk away. And that, and this is something that happens again and again and again. And um, I don't know what the answer to it is. I mean, there are some like you know nonprofit news sites that are now cropping up because at least the internet you can have you can have a lower cost of doing business. You know, you can still produce news. I mean, at the Globe, we think we print a paper, but we think web first now all the time. It's like. Get it on the web, and then they're like, "Oh yeah, that's right. That's going to paper now." Yeah. And it's become a bit more of an afterthought. But um, so there are there are nonprofit places cropping up that are doing local news. But again, it's still they're really hard to scale, and um, it's hard to do without without money. And the it's hard to make a lot of money on those places either. So it's and online advertising does not pay what print advertising right. does. People simply won't pay that much for an online ad. So. Um, I'm not sure what the answer is, but I, you know, I appreciate your dilemma because a lot of places share it. Well, I think it puts us in a dangerous position because people don't know where to get real news from. Yeah. And, you know, now with AI and, uh, you know, opportunities for more mis and disinformation uh, being spread, to have a trusted news source that you can rely on, that you know is legitimate, is really, you know, super important. Yeah. In fact, I, I know exactly what you mean because just... Recently, I was called in for one day to help after the Lewiston shootings to try to track down relatives of people who died. And so, you know, I spent a lot of time online that day. And I'm like, oh my God, the amount of disinformation um, just circulating about that was astounding. And if you didn't know any better, I feel like that's part of our job. Sift through all this and let's find, let's actually get to real people. Right, because some of these real people are mixed in with all this disinformation and misinformation, and um, it was astounding how just the, the volume of it. Um, so it's I hadn't really thought of it that way, but you're right. It's you, if you don't have a trusted news source, you're a lot more vulnerable. Hmm. Thank you. Before before you leave, the podium, <laughs> you've written other books as well. Yes. Uh, could you just Sure. Yeah. So this is my first nonfiction book I wrote. Um, uh, so, all right. That's a, I don't know, another 60 second story. All right. So I started off, I was, I was a writer at the Lowell sign and I was dispatched one day as a reporter to just go cover someone who had died under a railroad bridge. It sort of happens a lot in Lowell. So I got lost. It took me a while to get there. By the time I got there, everything was done. You could see that there had been resuscitation had tried to at least been attempted. There was like a dispatch glove. There's some like medical, you know, stuff around. And I'm like, oh, I don't really know what happened here. So um, I had to follow up, check with the police and, and the ambulances and figured out that someone had overdosed and they had died. There, right. So um, I'm not quite sure how I did it. This was a long time ago, but I ended up connecting with um, the wife, common law wife, girlfriend of the man who had died. And I met her in a cafe in Lowell and she told me their story and they were heroin addicts who had come from New, from, uh, from Canada. And they came down to Boston, I mean to Lowell because they had, I don't know, some sort of friend or family connection, which of course didn't work out. And they ended up living under this railroad bridge with a other collection of addicts, maybe a dozen or so people, usually not more than a handful at a time. And they had been living there for two years under this bridge that most people in town drove over every day. Uh, so I thought, well, this is a, a dynamite story. And I, um, I didn't really have the 
skills to tell it then as I would now, but I, I could tell it was great because of the candor that I'm getting from, from the people involved. That's what really makes a good human story is candor. So I you know, wrote this story and editor took a look at it and didn't like it, didn't want to do it, didn't want to give more attention to the heroin problem than we absolutely had to, which I think is kind of a, a crime against journalism. But anyway, he spiked the story. That's the language we use because in the old days, the editor had a spike, a big nail coming out of his desk and things were done on typewriters way before my time. They would take it and say, I don't want this. And they would slam it on the spike. And your story has been spiked. It's not going to run. We still use the language. So my story gets spiked. And I can remember as he's telling me he's not going to run the story, I can feel this like wave of heat coming <laughs> up my neck over my scalp. Like, oh, this is, was really terrible. And, you know, I'm Basically, at the time, two missed paychecks from the homeless myself, so I can't even quit. And um, I just had to suck it up. But I thought, all right, why don't I try just writing this story in fiction? So I fictionalized everyone involved, and I sort of wrote this story about a reporter investigating something in Lowell. And uh, I'm like, well, maybe I'll make it a murder mystery. So I expanded the story. And at some point, he ends up under this exact railroad bridge talking to the exact people that I had spoken to in fictionalized form. And uh, I wrote the book and I sold it. And, um, um, and I remembered very Fondly going back to Lowell to the bookstore there and sign, doing a signing in down, uh, to downtown Barnes and Noble after my story on this um, based on this had been spiked in the newspaper and that that so that sort of started me and I wrote you know another another book in that series um, with the same character based in Lowell then I went to a different publisher and I wrote a couple of books based in Providence I was looking in Providence so I wrote a couple of mystery books there so I had four crime fiction books that are um, uh, written between like 2005 and 2009. And then I got my job at the Globe and then, you know, that took a lot of time. So, um, you know, I have another book now my agent has, you know, that we're out shopping. So maybe I'll come back someday and talk about that one. You Thank you. Again? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for asking that question. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank right. you. Great.